In today's modern world, is there such a thing as normal family life? Who's to say what's normal? Some families enjoy a dangerous life. Some crave a relaxing life. And some just like the wildlife. In this series, we'll be visiting households across the globe to celebrate the wonderful, the inspirational, and the eccentric. Welcome to the world's most extraordinary families. In this episode, the remarkable family who live every day knowing that their bones could break as easily as glass. I've had probably 150 to 200 broken bones throughout my lifetime. The super strong Vegas family who are so competitive, failure is not an option. If I come to a competition, I'm going there to win. But first, the family who are getting ready for the end of the world. If you took your scariest experience and then multiplied that times 100, it'd probably be like what that was. Behind the doors of this nondescript apartment in New York lives a family of preppers. A prepper is somebody who prepares for a disaster, right? So whether that's a small local disaster to the grand disaster, you're prepared for an emergency. The Charles family, Dad Jason, Mum Angelique, and their children Maverick and Haley are all expert at prepping. Prepping is going camping, but not really. Um, a prepper is like doing camping, but showing people how to do stuff. Teaching how to like, you know, carve, start fires, and do uh, other things like that. You could show them what to pack or something that is compared to that. I prepare for all of it, you know, with the exception of a meteor smashing into this planet. I mean, reasonable things like uh, civil unrest, uh, pandemics, tornadoes, tsunamis, uh, earthquakes, you know, we're good to go. But despite the threats that nature poses, Jason's biggest fear is man-made. Financial collapse, you know, but then again, with everything going on with the volcanoes erupting left and right, who knows, you know, could Yellowstone go? It could, it can go tomorrow, it can go 500 years from now. But I'm a little more concerned with the financial collapse. New York City firefighter Jason first became interested in prepping in 2010, and soon his hobby began to take over his life, his cupboards and his hallways. It was slow at first. Um, then it just progressively went into bags and how to pack the bags, and he did a lot of research. So um, before you knew, he was like in a group, you know, New Yorkers that prep also and then somebody just reached out to him to do a show and it just warped into like this whole lifestyle for him. And then we kind of got absorbed into it as well. This is my food pouch with my food utensils. Jason and, now uh, produces a successful YouTube channel followed like by thousands this of subscribers where he shares his prepping expertise. I thought it was kind of crazy. But after 9-11, I always felt like I had to be prepared for something. The devastating attacks on the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan also had a dramatic effect on Jason, who at the time was serving as an emergency medical technician, or EMT. I became an EMT in 2000, September. And a year later, the 9-11 uh, attacks happened. And I responded off duty. And, you know, everybody knows what happens after that. You became an EMT and you work for the city or a fireman or a cop, it was your job to respond. On 9-11, I, I went into work, didn't know what was going on. I had left so late and I didn't see what was going on. So none of us were prepared. I just was so lucky that I had sneakers in my, at my desk. So I would say like, at least have something prepared at, at your job. Water, pills, any kind of medicine, that you need shoes, socks, anything that you think you would need to get out. Yeah, when they, when they collapsed, it was time to run. Yeah. And then when you ran, it was almost like a sense of, uh, I'm dead, but got to try anyway. If you took your, your scariest experience and then multiply that times 100, it would probably be like what that was. 
But it wasn't his exposure to the devastation of 9-11 that got Jason and his family prepping. Their interest started after Jason read a book about an attack on the USA that knocked out power and sent the country back to the Dark Ages. They talked about this being a possible attack, how this can happen and this could, you know, millions of people will die and all. And then with that, I closed the book and flipped out and started prepping. Just started buying things that I didn't need, um, spending money that I shouldn't spend. And nonetheless, now I'm here, you know, ready with all this gear and food, uh, hoping it doesn't happen, you know. But what sort of threats are the Charles family prepared for? And what exactly would make them leave the Big Apple and head for the hills? So there's certain things you can see coming and you'll leave ahead of time, and there are other things that you um, you wait it out and see where it goes. But you, you have to use your judgment. Anything that has to do with bad air, like a nuclear attack, um, a blizzard, of course, hurricanes, you stay home. Civil unrest, people acting a fool outside, and you don't have any way to protect yourself, like no guns, stay indoors. Um, if it's a situation where people are dying off because of a disease, a pandemic of some kind. But whatever the emergency, Jason is ready for okay, anything. so this is my end of the world closet. It's a joke, just easy to identify, but this is where I keep all my preps and other things like Christmas decorations, and things like that. But um, most of our supplies are in here. I would say probably around six months or so of uh, food and water in, in here. Water is super important. You can live 30 days or more without food, but without water, you can only live maybe three days. As well as his cupboard, Jason also has a secret storage unit across town where he keeps even more supplies. And then in the storage unit, we have another six months worth of food and water there. That's not including the food that we keep underneath the bed, which is probably another month or two. So in the house, we probably have running with between six, seven to eight months worth of food. Canned goods, MREs, MREs are meals ready to eat. They're those military pouches to food in. Processed foods, say noodles, dehydrated foods. We even have dehydrated milk. We've, we even bought a dehydrator to dehydrate our own fruits and vegetables. Vacuum sealed uh, strawberries and bananas. I did this two years ago, three years ago? No, four years ago. Pretty sure this is not great. Unfortunately for Jason, his dehydrated delights don't go down that well with the kids. I'd be like, I'm gonna throw up, so I'll take a pass. Well, this, which I wanna show you, this is what an MRE looks like. There's two meals in here. But then you have all the extra stuff, the toasted pastry, crackers, tortillas, dessert bars, uh, beef jerky, hot sauce, ugh, uh, hand cleaner, caffeinated gum, you know. This, this stuff, this first strike stuff is expensive. I'm a financial person, I work in finance, and for all the money that my husband has spent on prepping, has kind of given me a headache. <laughs> I want bananas buying this stuff. Like the first three, four months, I must have spent two, three grand, easy. So I, I'm, I definitely have probably touching 15 grand worth of stuff. In the beginning, it was hard, but now I've just learned to be like, ah, whatever, okay, fine. You know, because I know it's for the better interest of the entire family. Later on, we'll be finding out how Jason and the kids get ready in case disaster strikes. But now, the remarkable family who refuse to let their disabilities stop them enjoying life to the full. Meet Lisa Ferrario and Chris Lamoureux, who live in Denver, Colorado. This couple live with a rare condition called osteogenesis imperfecta. It's a rare uh, brittle bone disorder. The collagen in our, our bone isn't like everybody else's, and we break a lot of bone. I've probably broken 150 to 200 bones. I kind of lose count after a while. Probably lost count at about 100. But what makes this couple even more remarkable was their decision to adopt a child with exactly the same condition. Hi, my name is Anisi Lamoureux. I'm 15 years old, and I love my bird and art. I was born in Belize, and um, when I was seven years old, 
I got adopted by my parents, Lisa and Chris Lamo. We flew to Belize. We drove straight to the uh, children's home to meet her. And she was sitting there. Her bag was sitting next to her. Her bags were packed. She was ready to go. When I first met my parents, I was just waiting for them, kind of nervous. Then they came out and I saw my mom, my grandma, my aunt, my dad, uh, which was so cool. And I was like immediately ready to go home to my family. She never looked back. She never once was scared. It was just like she knew that she was going to be part of our family and it was meant to be. And she fit in from the very first second. It's, it was amazing. It was important to uh, to us to adopt a child that had a Y just because we felt that um, we could give that child the best life. So we um, looked through an adoption agency and finally they found Anisi and she was in Belize and we applied uh, for the adoption. It took about two and a half years. We had a lot of conversations about it, but I mean, I think we knew we wanted to be parents and we also knew that with our ex shared experience of growing up with the Y. We wanted to be able to share that with somebody. They know when I'm hurting or how to deal with that and how to take care of that and, you know, what hospitals to go to and what doctors to see. A normal family um, would not know anything about that. So that's pretty cool. But as Lisa and Chris know all too well, their condition is not only debilitating, it can also be very painful. I've had probably 150 to 200 broken bones throughout my lifetime. Uh, Chris the same, and probably Anisi is close to the same. It happens a lot when you're younger. I think as you get older and go through puberty and grow up a bit, the fractures happen less. A lot of times when I broke stuff as a kid, it was because I was doing something stupid. Like I played wheelchair basketball, which is really not something someone with a Y should do. But as Anisi found out recently, you don't have to be playing sports for injuries to occur. In school, I was reaching back for my folder and my arm just popped and I knew that it was gonna be a break. But she heals very quickly and we all have a pretty high pain tolerance. So um, she's not down for long. <laughs> but living with osteogenesis imperfecta or OI means a regular home would make life very different for Lisa and her family so they had theirs specially modified. The counters are lower, as well as the stove. It's lower so I can reach the burners. And um, the cabinets below have been taken out so that I can easily put my chair under like this. Although living with OI can be a challenge, Anisi doesn't let it stop her enjoying one of her favorite hobbies. I started painting at the age of three. And when I got adopted, my mom could tell that I really like art and stuff. And said, why don't you see if you want an art lesson? My favorite thing about painting is expressing my feelings through my artwork and making other people happy. That's a big part about why I like painting so much. Ooh, look at that. I really like that. Sometimes there will be like one stroke that really pops out, like this stroke right here and um, I just leave it be. And Anisi has certainly put her talents to good use. I auctioned off two paintings that sold for $100,000 for a children's hospital. The colors that she uses and the way she expresses herself is so vi vibrant and um, brings everything to life. Just kind of like her and her personality, which is awesome. And I'm, I'm happy that she uses these things for good, like she donated the money, um, raised money for Children's Hospital here in Colorado. And I think that's a really good way to use um, her talent. And we'll be catching up with Lisa and her family later as they show off their talents to a global audience. But now we're off to Sin City and the family who have an extraordinary claim to fame. Fabulous Las Vegas is famous the world over for its nightlife, its casinos, and the golden mile that is the Vegas Strip. This Nevada city is also home to a rather unique family. Hi, my name is Callie Best, and I have the strongest family in the world. Callie and her family, Dad Nick, son Dylan, and daughter Jessica, or JJ, might not be as renowned as their hometown, but between them, 
they hold several world records and have been awarded hundreds of trophies and won competitions around the world. They're also really, really strong. I've been the two-time lightweight champion in the US. Um, I've won Nevada's Strongest Woman. Uh, I've won an international contest up in Canada. If I come to a competition, I'm going there to win. More weight. I won six straight California Best Lifter. I got into Strongman in 2005. I have like five, six world records in Strongman still. It's broke 11 world records, but I still hold six of them. Our family is very extraordinary. Like, not a lot of people can do what we can do. I have all my friends on the strongest. <laughs> We're definitely not like normal families. I've never really had a garage, like, like ever. Like, my whole garage all the time has been a gym. I met Kelly on Valentine's Day, <laughs> 2008. I was sitting at a table with some of our strongman friends, and he got out of the elevator. And it was like something out of a movie where we looked at each other, we saw each other, our eyes locked. And we couldn't take our eyes off one another. I, I, she's one of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. And just, I was like, wow. I guess you could say it was love at first sight. And of course I looked away and I said, hey, who's that guy getting out of the elevator? And our friend goes, oh, that's Nick Best. And um, the rest is history, I guess. For this super strong family, it's no surprise that staying active is a really important part of their life. We do have a thing at our household that is mandatory for the kids to compete in something. Yeah, right, I know. They need to be athletic. They need to develop the habits of training and eating so that as they get older, they can still enjoy their life. All kids should play sports. All kids should be active. The problem is, is that kids are sitting around and not doing enough. If kids were all playing sports, we would have a lot less problem with obesity in America. But in this household, taking part is not the aim of the game. Participation trophies, those like those don't mean anything. It's like, oh, I think they're garbage. Uh, when my children bring home participation medals, I will throw them away. Congratulations, you have a pulse. No. Teaching them how to work hard, have a good work ethic, be tough, and follow through is more important than congratulations, you showed up. Everybody participates. The person in first place obviously worked a lot harder, and the person in last place didn't really try. And when your daughter can do this, who are we to argue? Jessica's really strong. She can flip a 200 pound tire. She can pick up like a 50 pound keg. She can deadlift her body weight and a little over. But understandably, Nick and Callie have faced criticism for letting their kids lift weights at such a young age. We've gotten criticism about the kids working out. And again, I just tell them, well, you don't know what you're talking about. And most of the doctors, in fact, really don't know what they're talking about. People have opinions about everything. People say, oh, that kid's going to be short. They would say that about Dylan all the time. Dylan is like towering over me. He's as tall as Nick. I'm not having them do anything that's going to hurt them. Scientific journals of medicine are doing studies about weight-bearing exercises for kids and how it does help to denser their bones. If your, bo your bones are dense, it doesn't mean they're not going to grow. Your bones are going to grow. People just don't know or understand and a lot of the old way of thinking that was completely incorrect is still being taught by a whole lot of people. Whatever they are, they're always experts in their own uh, heads about things. And we'll be back with the best family later as Nick lifts the lid on his pre-competition diet. But now we're heading back to the Big Apple and the family who are preparing for the worst case scenario. Today, our preppers, the Charles family, are practicing how to pack their emergency essentials, or as it's known, the bug out bag. Well, I'll show you what's inside the, uh, the bug out bag. This is my uh, comprehensive medical kit. Band-aids, gauze, Tylenol, wipes, and a tourniquet, again, just in case for a serious bleeds. I also have a tweezer. I do carry a surgical sewing kit if you have an arterial bleed or something like that. It's not in this bag. Actually, I actually don't know where the hell it is. Water jug, water canteen. Emergency bar, it tastes like crap. My first 
bug out bag had a lot of gear in it. And it was a lot of crap I didn't have to carry. Now that the kids are older, they can carry their own stuff. But the wife carries a tank, so my bag is minimal now. But in the prepping world, practicing in your living room only gets you so far. Nothing beats heading out into the wild for a field test, which Jason shares on YouTube. The next footage you're going to see is me building or have my shelter built <clears throat> and hopefully my fire, not hopefully, and my fire going. This is my setup. I decided to build a firewall after all, as you can see there. Um, and it's pretty warm in there. But for Jason, a big part of prepping is sharing his bushcraft skills with his family. And today is no exception. Today we're taking them to the park. We're gonna teach them how to uh, get a fire started. I never did this before ever, and I'm excited. <laughs> I'm not a drill instructor screaming at them at 3 o'clock in the morning, get up, we gotta go, you know, banging pans. And I've seen that before, so we don't do that. But you try to keep it fun with them. I love the fact that he's teaching the children so that they're ready, they, they know. Hold it like that, angle it down. You get them to get used to the tool, scraping it to get a spark. Then you get them used to uh, the kind of tinder that it's gonna take to get the fire started. There you go. There we go. Okay. When they first started, they were two and three. So now, now that they're nine and 10, it's so much easier for them to even talk about and explain to other people what they have. I was able to do a spark. None of my friends could do it at all. Knowledge is king. We've done certain things like um, bug out weekends and stuff like that. We do have our bug out bags ready to go. First aid kit. There you go. If someone got hurt, basically, for example, my brother, I would take out my first aid kit and get to work. I know that you know, the wife would know what to grab and, and, and when to leave. And then this is my toothbrush that I don't often use. Everybody is paranoid until it happens. And then okay. when it happens, the first steps would just be to watch and see. Don't panic, you know? You don't want to be the idiot hanging out in the woods and then nothing's going on, you know? If you interview other preppers, you'd be surprised at how some of them think. They think just because they have everything, they're good. It doesn't work that way. It's an ugly game, but it's years of practice. It's years of thinking about all the things that can happen and how you're going to counteract each thing that might happen. And we'll be catching up with the Charles family later as Dad serves up dinner with a difference. But now, back in Colorado, Lisa and her family are preparing for a meal of their own. In Denver, Chris and Lisa are a couple that go way back. When Chris was born, his uh, doctor actually put his parents in contact with my mom, because I'm a bit older than he is, and said, can you come to the hospital? Because we have this um, baby that was born that has a Y, and maybe show the parents and talk to them about how do you pick that child up, change that child's um, diapers, or carry that child. So she did that, and that's when we first met Chris and his family. And then we were friends for like five or so years, close friends, and then his family moved away. The pair kept in touch for more than 20 years before finally meeting up and falling in love. I was at Stanford for grad school and I started coming out here every other week to visit her. And eventually she convinced me to move here. Shortly after that, I decided to buy an engagement ring. Yeah, it's a pretty great love story. Mm -hmm. But for Chris, Lisa wasn't the only love of his life. I'm a space dork. I've been a Star Wars dork since I was like six. I'm a... And this lifelong passion eventually led to a successful career with a certain little organization called NASA. I was a mechanical design engineer and I'm very proud of the work I did there. I helped invent the um, weightlifting machine that the astronauts use on the International Space Station right now. It's been up there since 2008. And Chris isn't the only genius in the household. High five. All right. Oh my God, there's so many things I can talk about bourbon. He, in the day, likes to sleep, okay? But then, 
He can also use the toilet, um, like the normal toilet. He'll jump up on the toilet and poop or pee. He's just amazing. He has, he has a huge character. Hi, I know. I need to switch chairs with you, Bourbon. We rescued him from a place here in Denver as well, and he is fantastic. He's another companion for, for us. Um, he's super smart. He does many things that cats don't usually do. He sits up on our chair. He rides around the house with us, and he provides entertainment and comfort to us as well. And there's another member of this extraordinary household that the family couldn't do without. Okay, good job. Pearl is the very best dog ever. She is a golden doodle. She turned five this year. Pearl was born with a cleft palate, and so her breeder could not sell her like the other puppies. And the trainer who trained her saw something in Pearl that was perfect for our family, and she asked if we would be interested in having a service dog. And of course we were. And she um, was trained to do certain tasks for us that we may need, but she picks up everything that we drop. She is a constant companion for us. Um, she um, sits with Anisi when she um, hurts herself and comforts her, which is so awesome. Um, and she closes the refrigerator. Close it. Yay, all right, good job. She can throw things away. She gets a Kleenex. Thank you, good job. She does all sorts of tasks for us that, again, the average person might take for granted that you drop your keys. But for us, dropping our keys are like, oh. I mean, you don't realize how often you drop stuff and you guys can just lean down and pick it up, no problem. And you know, that's really hard for us. So that's really nice to have Pearl to help. Thank you. Go get Bourbon's dish. Good girl, thank you. Okay, let's head down here and give you some food. But whilst Bourbon and Pearl have been catered for, cooking for the rest of the family is often a lot more involved. I have a little cooking show on YouTube. It's called The Little Chef. Hey everyone, I have Anisi here with me. And uh, today we are going to make Giada's chicken marsala meatballs. Woo, slippery little meatball, come back here. <laughs> I love cooking. It's something that I can do and I enjoy. I think it's kind of how I express love to my family. And um, it's just a cool time to spend together um, and to show people what we can do and what we can make. and. Uh, then at the end, we get to eat it all. So that's good too. Today, the stars of the show are embracing their Italian heritage and taking Lisa's mum, Diane, Auntie Dot, and their friend, Stacy to stock upon ingredients for tonight's cooking show. So right now we are all headed to Valenti's Deli. Good Italian stuff. Aunt Dot loves these. So for sure, we're gonna buy these for dessert. And now we're going to go look at the meat counter and buy some mortadella and some meat. We're gonna get some mild Italian sausage. One of these rolls, just like that, for tonight. In tonight's edition of The Little Chef, Lisa's dish of Italian meatballs in sauce has been handed down from her auntie Dot. But is Dot willing to share her secret recipe with us? Oh no, that's oh, no. Oh, then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> I think there's a misconception that when you see just an average friend hanging around with some people that maybe have some physical challenges that it's a helping situation when that's not the case. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank Come to you. see us again soon. <laughs> Bye, Dot. Take care. Everybody that comes through the front door is unique. And I think we could all take a cue from their family. They're just amazing people. We'll be catching up with Lisa and her family shortly as the curtain rises on the latest installment of The Little Chef. But first, we're heading back to Vegas with the best family. And what better way to spend an afternoon in the Nevada sun than dragging a truck down a road? Back in Vegas and strongman Nick Best has a serious rival to contend with. Dylan and I are starting to get a lot more competitive together because he's finally starting to catch up. And there's a few things he can beat me in now. I, I used to run faster than him, and I used to tease him. I'm like, bud, you can't run faster than a 300-pound old man. You need to run faster. You can run faster than me now. I think. Well, he doesn't have abs like these, you know? 
look, you don't, you don't have them like me. He's not built like me. I would say me and my dad sometimes have little moments of like mas masculinity, like we. Sometimes I try to mess with him, you know, because you always got to mess with your dad. I come up and like start punching him or start, you know, trying to wrestle him. And then he'll just flip me and then I'm on the floor the next moment. And I'm just like, oh, yep, now I know why you're the boss and I'm not, so. And it's not just Dylan and his dad who are competitive. We are all very competitive. You know, races to the mailbox, the last one there. JJ won. She cheated, but she won. Well, you cheated too. She cheated first. No. It's very competitive, I would say. My stick just like happened to hit your stick. My stick just happened to hit your ball. No, that's not how that works. All right, we're gonna do a pull-up contest. We're competitive in like everything we do. Me and JJ are always competing. Who can hold on longer? Yeah. All right. It's fun to have those competitive things with your kids. <laughs> Why did I do this? <laughs> you were a gymnast, this isn't fair. They're like any brother and sister, I mean, they fight a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. Yes, I did. I won. Like, we have this little handshake that we do, and we are like, we always try to be the fastest person to do it. We monkey around, um, and we just have a good time at it. But it does push us to work hard. I mean, he really does a good job being a big brother to her. He really does. Dylan, he is like the brother of my dreams. He's my best friend. I hang out with him every day, and he's just really awesome. I don't think I can do anymore. I think I'm falling, JJ. Yeah, that, that looks pretty dramatic. <laughs> we always challenge each other to like do races or something with our lacrosse sticks. Or something fun. You cheated twice, I only cheated once. But Dylan knows all too well if he wants to compete with his world record holding dad, he's got to pull his weight. Uh, looks like Dylan's doing a truck pull. We're gonna be pulling a 5,000 pound truck today. And today, the family's friends and neighbors have turned up to offer their support. I, I love it when the kids come over and they train and do stuff instead of playing video games or watching TV. It's gonna be fun to watch. We might have to attach the tire though to the back just to make it harder for them. Oh, Dad, no, we're not adding a tire. It'll probably turn it into a 20 plus thousand pound vehicle, the equivalent to. Normally, you have momentum and it doesn't really slow you down, but this is gonna be dragging, which is gonna make it a lot harder. Uh, if I make it easier, it won't get any better. I'm ready. I'm ready. Ready? Go! Come on, keep moving. Faster. 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 Come on. Here, drive. Drive. You're in the zone. Drive. Yeah. Yeah. You're over the wall. Yeah. Faster. Drive your feet. Go, go, go. Yeah! Yeah! My legs are a little on fire right now. I'm very proud. Of and after that tiring experience, it's Nick's turn to do some working out. But right now, he's working out how to fuel his 308 pound body in time for this weekend's annual Mr. Olympia event. If I sit around and don't do anything all day, I'm still burning 3,500 calories without, without fail. And believe it or not, Nick's actually trying to put on a few pounds. With Nick having to try to make weight this upcoming weekend for his competition, we need to uh, make sure that his diet is right on point. Two cups of ground beef, carrots. A lot of the stuff you prepare ahead of time so it doesn't take that long. Where there's about two cups of white rice. And the reason why you eat this is it's very easily digested. Organic chicken stock. Two minutes, and when that's done, we're good to eat. We'll be back in Vegas later as the day of the big competition dawns for Nick. But now, in New York, it's dinner time in the Charles household. Okay, so this is an MRE, Meals Ready to Eat. Military foods, and under the right conditions, they can last for years. All right, so this is an old one. This was, it's probably on the box. My favorite food is spaghetti. Mine's a steak. Yeah. This one's called marinara sauce with meatballs. It probably tastes like crap. This is some, sort of like a backup, right? You fall back on these. You don't um, eat them right away. All right, so whatever canned goods we have in the closet, we'll, we'll eat all, we'll go through that first. Once we hit these, we know we have probably six months. 
this actually expired three years ago, according to the code. Maybe longer than that, actually. Ah, uh, eight years ago. Expired eight years ago. Yeah. <laughs> this should be fun. If the kids uh, start puking, then it's bad. If it's expired, I'm not eating. I don't want to throw up. This stuff lasts forever, guys. It doesn't get old. If Wait, so can I eat it? If it's good, I'm going to eat the whole thing. The good thing about boiling it in a pan, you can keep using the water. So in a disaster situation, you don't want to keep draining the water out. You let this water be the boiled water. And of course, if it evaporates a little bit, you add a little more to it. But you don't dump the whole thing out every time you're done with it. So as the tension mounts, What's the verdict on the eight-year-old meatballs? All right, good. This is the only one I would tolerate. I think a beef stew might be good, too. We have the beef stew. Oh, my God. You want? No. Oh, my God. Here you go. Kids need to adapt to what they could eat, so they know that the possibility is there. That doesn't mean that it's going to happen next year or 20 years from now. So it's good that they, uh, they open themselves up to trying it out and that they like it because we got a ton of that crap, so. For Jason, it's not the threat of nuclear war, civil unrest, or a tsunami that keeps him going, though. It's spending time with and protecting his loved ones. Family's very important. I think with society today, we've gotten away from that. Um, I think people are selfish. When you start being selfish and only thinking about yourselves and all the trips you can go on and all the places you can see, guess what? I do that with my kids. We take them on trips, we go places. Family is important. Family is, is what's going to carry you through any uh, disaster, you know. Um, but selfishness is not. Lisa and her family are setting the scene for the latest installment of their online culinary adventure, The Little Chef. Anise is going to set the camera up. And the lights. I record and um, I'll say like, okay, stop. Now we're going to do this and that. Uh, no, a little bit higher. Okay. No, other side. Okay. This gives me a time to boss mom. No. That would put this you have to here. put it other way, mom. Right you have back. to turn it. All righty. Get <laughs> What's that? This is the basil and the garlic. Okay. I'm ready. Hey everyone, welcome to The Little Chef. Today I am so, so pleased that I have my Aunt Dot here all the way from Florida. It's awesome to show people that um, someone with a disability can cook fantastic things, Going in. just like anybody, um, and maybe inspire some people that don't think they can because of a physical limitation to go ahead and cook. Okay, you're gonna tell me when? Yeah. Okay. Is it when yet? Now it's when. Now it's when. Okay. All right, so now we're going to have to put our hands in here. Okay, you gonna do it or you want me to do it? I'm gonna do it with you. Okay. Okay, you took off all your jewelry. Yes. What if I can't get it off? Then we'll just cut your finger. Okay, it came off. Okay, all right. All right, I'm headed over to the stove. We'll be right back. It's awesome to cook um, and have the three generations because it's so important that, um, you know, Aunt Dot passes things on to me. And same with my mom, she passes things on. I love that tradition of passing everything on to an EC. And someday she'll pass it on. Oh, this looks lovely. Look, they're beautiful. All right, thanks guys. I hope you enjoy the meatballs, bye. Done. Woo! Woo! Very good. That's a wrap. Way to go. With another episode safely in the can, the family can finally relax and enjoy the fruits of their labors. There are so many things in our daily existence that are difficult or kind of bring us down. So it's important to celebrate the little things. It's lovely yeah. to have everybody together having a meal, and True. especially yeah. since you guys cooked it. We definitely have a unique family, which uh, 
Lisa, Chris, and Anisi in, in all-in-wheel chairs, and they always seem to be able to do anything they want to do. There's nothing Lisa can't do. I'm so proud of her. Um, I want to make a little toast to Aunt Dot being here, and to doing the cooking show, and to family. And I love you guys all. Cheers. Cheers. Our family is the most important thing. They bring me joy, and knowing that they are I'm happy is extremely important to me. My mom is amazing. She supports me in everything I do, and my dad is the same. I'm very proud of Anisi. I see a lot of me in her, like the resilience and determination. I, I know that she can do anything she puts her mind to. They, they are the best parents that I could hope for. Back in Vegas, strongman Nick Best's competition is fast approaching. We're packing for the Olympia powerlifting meet. It's gonna happen Saturday. He has been preparing to break world records in the squat, in the deadlift, and in the bench press. I try to lay everything out, like on a table or something, so I can see it, and just mentally check through everything in my head. This is like a ritual you go through every time you go to make sure you have everything that you need to compete with. The next few days before the show, I let them be. I don't pick fights. I don't cause drama. I just keep everything as happy and organized as I can. It does, to a certain degree, help me get in the zone a bit. I also relax because it's something else I don't have to worry about. I know where everything is. I know it's good to go. I just got to grab the bag and head out the door. Competition day has finally arrived. Good morning. Just trying to finish breakfast, trying. The morning of a competition, Nick wakes up, he has his normal breakfast, he does his normal routine. Before a competition, now I just mainly feel anxious. You know, as it's coming up, it's like, come on, get here. I've been preparing this for like eight weeks. It's like, come on, it's time to roll. I run up to my dad competing, it gets really hectic in the house. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of people coming in and out, people coming over. Yeah, I got a bunch of friends that came in. There's going to be a whole bunch more at the contest. Are you guys coming? Yeah, they're there to come watch and hang out and support and keep my head straight. The Expo's a lot of fun. It's a great atmosphere. People, you get to see the people that like follow you on all of your social media and stuff like that because they'll just walk right up to you and ask you for a picture. And it's great meeting those people and hearing from a lot of them how you inspire them to live their lives better, and that's, that's kind of cool. It's neat to see you're having a positive influence on people. The moment before I go on stage, it's just like anticipation. It's like, here we go, I'm gonna go up, and this is what I work hard for, this is what I put on all the work in, now I'm just gonna go show what I did. And it's, it's fun and exciting. It's, that alone just hits you with an adrenaline rush. It's like, <laughs> so you go up there and it, you just feed off of it. You learn to use it to your advantage. I got no point to prove to anybody anymore, but there's goals that I have, so now I'm just proving stuff to me. I got to answer to myself now. Oh, I broke the world record. So much very good. My hopes are to break the world record in the squat and break the world record in the deadlift. If I have a good day, I wouldn't mind breaking the total world record as well. So today I ended up breaking three records, so it was pretty good. I'm a little tired, but not bad. I actually feel pretty good. I'm in shape, so something like this shouldn't knock you out or have you wasted. I'll retire when I'm not having fun. When it ceases to be fun and it becomes a job and it's just like, going through a grind and I just don't enjoy it anymore, that's when I'm going to stop. But for Nick, none of this would be possible without his nearest and dearest. Oh, I loved having Dylan and JJ here. It was really important to me. When I travel internationally and I compete in strongman, they don't get to go to a lot of this stuff because it's so far away. So it, it meant a lot to have them there today. I think kids really enjoy watching him because they can see that the hard work does yield good results. Going to the competitions and being there when they win and, um, you know, running out there when he's crying and, like, giving him a hug and he's all sweaty and just smells bad. It's just, I'll never forget those moments. 
Yeah, it's really fun, but it's kind of scary because you don't know if they're going to get hurt or not. I'm aware of where Callie is, and I look to see where the kids are before I go. Good job, Dad! They're the loudest ones out there, well, besides me. My family inspires me. They're 100% of my inspiration. We all sacrifice for each other's success because when it's competition time, it's competition time. Oh, you're getting so big. I love them to death, and just uh, having them there, having them go through it, having them yell, have them come up to me afterwards, JJ with her hugs, it just means the world to me. I would not be doing this without them.